The following program, Search the Scriptures, is brought to you by the Highway 5 South Church of Christ in Mountain Home. Speakers are Keith Sharp and Trevor Campbell. We invite you to call or write the church to submit questions for the speakers to answer. We'll provide answers from the Bible to your questions. Trevor, how many tattoos do you have? <laughs> hey, that's a personal question. <laughs> that's a very personal question, isn't it? So, uh, we're going to talk about the tattoos this evening. That's one of the questions that we've been given to talk about, so we'll cover that question. Good evening. I'm Keith Sharp. I preach at the Highway 5 South Church of Christ in Mountain Home. Uh, my partner on the program is Trevor Campbell. Trevor, please introduce yourself and the Brethren in Piatt. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Keith. Yeah, my name is Trevor Campbell. And I do worship over in Piatt with the brethren that meet there on Highway 62. We're on the north side of the highway, right there on the highway uh, next to the New Dollar General. Pretty easy to find. And I preach there as well. If you'd like to come and worship with us, we do meet on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. for a Bible class. And that's a, an open discussion of the Word of God. And I lead that class. And then at 10.45 a.m. we have a worship service. And we'd love to have you come out and participate in both of those. If you'd like to reach me, my phone number is 870 435 2737. Call me there if you have a question about the, the church that meets there, or if you have a question that you would like Keith and I to discuss on this program, give me a call there. And of course, I'm the preacher at the Highway 5 South Church of Christ in Mountain Hall. We have our services. We have Bible classes at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. We have an 11 o'clock worship assembly and a 2 o'clock Sunday afternoon worship assembly. We also have a midweek service at 7 o'clock on Wednesday evening, and we have a, a wonderful ladies' Bible class. Uh, the ladies love that Bible class uh, at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning. And you're invited to these services, of course, the ladies to the ladies' Bible class. To get to our building, you'll turn south off of Highway 62412, the bypass, uh, onto Highway uh, 5, going south toward Salesville Mountain uh, and uh, Mountain I'll get it out in a minute, Mountain View, uh, and we're one mile to the south on the left. After you pass uh, the Good Samaritan on the right, then look for our sign on the left, the Highway 5 South Church of Christ. You're invited to our services, and I believe you'll be uh, very much benefited by coming to worship and Bible classes with us. Now, we invite you, those of you who watch this program, to give us your questions, and that's what we do so far as the subject matter on this program, we answer the questions that were given by our listeners, by those who watch the program. You can give me a question by calling 870-321-5746, or you can email me at keithsharp2021 at gmail.com, or if you prefer to write, you can do that to Post Office Box 263 in Mountain Home, 726 let us know what your Bible question is, and we will give you an answer from the Bible. We won't tell you our opinions. We won't tell you what a church creed says. We'll tell you what the Bible says. Well, Trevor, needless to say, on this question we've been given, the question is, is it okay to get a tattoo? Uh, we have a problem to say what the Bible says on that. It has precious little to say about it. But Trevor, tell us what the Bible says about getting a tattoo, please. <laughs> Well, the only place that I'm aware of in the entire Bible that speaks of tattoos specifically is in Leviticus chapter 19 in the giving of the law. And we do need to keep that in mind that it's part of the, the law of Moses. And it came with some other, um, uh, in the immediate context, that is, some other commandments from God. I'm going to, uh, to begin reading in chapter 19 of Leviticus in verse 26, where he says, You shall not eat anything with the blood... Now, that right there, and we're going to see the tattoos in just a moment, but that right there is something found uh, prior to the law, uh, a law given to all of mankind uh, in, in Genesis. Then in the book of the law, here in Leviticus, given to the Israelites, but then also in the New Testament as well. So that's something we all have to follow uh, all through time. Nor shall you practice divination or soothsaying. You shall not shave around the sides of your head, nor shall you disfigure the edges of your beard, you shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor tattoo any marks on you. I am the Lord. All right, so you notice several, several things there. I, I brought up the blood because that is something we do have to still observe even today. But there are things here that we do not have to dis 
to observe any longer. These were strictly for the Israelites under the old law. For instance, he talks about shaving around the sides of your head. So, you know, in context, if we say, well, it's wrong to get a tattoo, well, then it'd also be wrong to, to shave around the sides of your head. And there are other things we could find here as well. So, you know, these things that um, the Israelites were commanded not to do, I don't know the, all the specifics on, on why, you know, the Lord said don't do it, so they, they weren't allowed to do it. Um, why he brings up tattoos exactly. But on some of the other things that are listed here, like not cutting your flesh or uh, the shaving of the head or disfiguring the, the beard, cutting the beard, well, these were practices of some of the heathen nations. And, and God did not want them to participate in these same practices. And, of course, these are things you can read about it in secular writings, but also the Bible touches on this a little bit, that the heathens were participating in these kinds of things. Now, again, it doesn't mention tattoos that I'm aware of ever again in the Bible, but it's in context with some of these things of cutting the flesh or, or shaving part of the head uh, or cutting the beard, uh, which are things that are, that are fine today. So in Jeremiah, there's an example of this in Jeremiah chapter 48 concerning the heathen nations. Here, God talks about the, the coming destruction of the Moabites, and he mentions some of their practices. In verse 37 of Jeremiah 48, he says, For every head shall be bald, and every beard clipped. On all the hands shall be cuts, and on the loins sackcloth. A general lamentation on all the housetops of Moab and in its street, streets. For I have broken Moab like a vessel, in which is no pleasure, says the Lord. So here it gives us a, a little clue that the heathen nations were participating in some of the things that back there in the immediate context of Leviticus 19, when he talked about tattoos, he also talked about cuttings and the shaving of the head and the cutting the beard and so forth. Well, here some of those things are listed here, and it was obviously uh, something the heathens were participating in. All right, Keith. Okay, thanks very much, Trevor. Yeah, yes, I believe you're right in the context, and of course, even... Uh, back in the context of the passage where uh, the tattoos are mentioned in Leviticus chapter 19. Uh, it says in verse 26, Nor shall you practice divination or soothsaying. And of course those were pagan practices uh, that uh, have some parallels, some things that go on today uh, in uh, appealing to occult uh, powers rather than appealing to, rather than taking our problems to God in prayer and so it definitely did tie in with the pagan practices and uh, again I say with Trevor as far as I know that's the only passage in the Bible that specifically deals with the matter of tattoos now uh, there are some principles we might apply uh, well before we go into those principles though I want to mention something Trevor mentioned the fact that it's found in the Old Testament and that has great significance for us today. This was a part of the Law of Moses. The book of Leviticus is a part of the Law of Moses, uh, as were uh, Exodus and, and, and Deuteronomy and Numbers. And in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, and by the way, Deuteronomy chapter 5 is the second recording of the Ten Commandments. Uh, and I want you to see the, uh, and of course the, the law concerning tattoos, along with the Ten Commandments, is a part of that law that God, through Moses, gave to Israel. Uh, the, uh, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. And Moses called all Israel, and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today that you may observe them and be careful to observe, to observe them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. Now Horeb is the general mountain range of which Mount Sinai was a part. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, that is not with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive. And so it was specifically with Israel that God made that covenant. And by the way, what follows is the Ten Commandments. That was a part of the covenant that God made with Israel. Now, the laws of the book of Leviticus, and by the way, that includes, for example, the laws concerning uh, what uh, meats were clean, what meats were unclean. Uh, the Israelites could not eat any fish that didn't have scales. They could not eat catfish. 
because catfish did not have scales. Uh, they, there were certain animals that could not eat uh, swine. They couldn't eat uh, pork because it does not chew the cud. Uh, the, the hog does not chew the cud. And, and so on and on, all of those things were part of the law that God gave to Israel. There's a number of passages in the New Testament that show that that law is not binding today. It was taken out of the way. It was nailed to the cross when Jesus died on the cross. I'm going to read briefly Colossians chapter 2. There's any number of passages we could give that shows this. But I'm going to look at Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13 down through verse 17. He says, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. So he's talking to Gentiles. They were uncircumcised. He is made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses having wiped out the handwriting of ordinances. Now here's ordinances that were written by hand. What's he talking about? He says that was against us, which is contrary to us, and he's taken out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So whatever this handwriting of ordinances is, when Jesus died on the cross, he nailed them to the cross, and they were taken out of the way. They were blotted out. They're no longer law for people today. Whether Jew or Gentile, they're no longer law. Well, what are these? All right, let's read on. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or in drink. Well, what law had various kinds of foods that people could not eat? Well, that's the law of Moses. That's the book of Leviticus, just like the law about tattoos is. Uh, and our new moons are Sabbaths. Well, that's the law of Moses, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. The Old Testament was taken out of the way, nailed to the cross. It's no longer our law. We're under law to Christ. And so the law concerning tattoos is not a part of the law of Christ. It's a part of the law of Moses. It was not given to us. Now, Trevor, I believe we agree on that, but I have another question for you that ties in with this. Are there any principles under the New Testament that we might apply to this matter of getting tattoos? Well, yeah, it's, it's possible. I'm not sure exactly what you have in mind. Well, it doesn't matter. Just go ahead and well, tell me what oh, you think about that okay. from the Scriptures. From a scriptural standpoint, um, well, I would expand it, you know, um, Tattoos are something we put on our body. Some, some of them are, uh, are hidden or covered, perhaps, on folks. Others are very well seen. Um, I think that the Bible does talk about appearances. And uh, so I, I would expand it not just to tattoos, but clothing or, or any kind of ornamentation, uh, any kind of jewelry or um, piercings, um, clothes that we wear. Uh, the Bible does show that we are to be concerned about our appearances. And... Uh, I think 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is a good example of that. It's one I was looking at a moment ago. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in context, deals with prophets and prophetesses, uh, male and female prophets. And both prophesied um, the, outside of the, the church, outside the assembly. Now, the men prophesied within the assembly, but outside the assembly, both men and women prophesied. And in, specifically in the context, he's mainly dealing with women prophets. And one of the things he deals with is appearances. So in the context, um, for women, he talks about, and again, he's writing to Corinth. That's very important. He's writing to the city of Corinth, and he talks about women who either have their heads shaved or shorn, as he, as he calls it, or have their heads unveiled. Well, he talks about it as being a shameful thing. Well, that was specific to their society, to the Corinthian society, because that wasn't true in every, in every case. The same is also, um, on, on the flip side of that, for men, he talks about it being shameful for a man to have long hair. Well, again, he's talking to Corinth, and we have to remember that, because the Jews, uh, male Jews, men had, wore their hair long, and in fact, the longer it was, it's like the more handsome you were. You know, it was a handsome thing. It was something men desired to have long hair. So it's not true in every case, but in Corinth, it was true. If a man had long hair, it was, it was shameful. It was like he's looking like a woman. And if a woman had her hair shaved, well, now she's looking like a man. And so for them, it was not proper. So the Bible does teach a, a concern about our appearance. Men are to look like men. Women are to look like women. And, uh, and, and there is to be a concern of how we come across our appearance. 
But uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 is another good example. That's another one I was, I was glancing at a moment ago. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, now the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy concerning conduct in the church. And uh, in verse 8, he says, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Now, there's two things here. Paul's not picking on the women, and he's not just letting the men off the hook. In the immediate context, you'll notice in verse 8, he talks about the men lifting up holy hands, pure, righteous, holy hands, praying with holy hands. But then he says, in like manner also the women. What he's talking about is, is holy conduct. And with the women, he does go into some specifics about their attire uh, for the time. And in verse 10, he says, basically he's saying, do what is proper for, for a woman that is professing to be a godly woman, who shows through good works that she is a, a, a pious, reverent individual uh, before God. So for both men and women, uh, need to be concerned about this as far as uh, our appearance being proper uh, in society. And also, you know, understanding that we want to have an appearance that doesn't look ungodly. And, uh, you know, before the before we filmed this uh, today, uh, we were talking with the gentleman that, uh, that is doing our filming currently, and he was talking about he's seen folks that have tattoos that are just very offensive and purposely offensive. Well, that would not be right for a Christian or someone trying to be a godly individual to put something like that on their bodies. That would, go, that would be directly against this, these uh, this commands that Paul has given. So that's an example right there. Okay, thanks, right. Trevor. That's a good discussion, Trevor. I appreciate that. Sure. And what you're doing is taking Bible principles and applying them to a specific subject that is not in the New Testament specifically covered. I want to add just a little bit to that. In Romans chapter 12, uh, the apostle is talking. Uh, the apostle Paul is talking about our lives as Christians, how we are to live, uh, in order to present our bodies as living sacrifices to God. We live transformed lives whereby we, we present ourselves as living sacrifices to God. And he gives a series of specific application to this in the latter part of Romans chapter 12. Now with that in mind, look at verse 17. Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Well, see, I believe this ties directly in with what Trevor is talking about. We have to be concerned about how we come across to other people. Or what we're doing, or even our appearance, is this considered to be good in the sight of all men? We want to maintain our influence for good on other people. So anything that would hinder our influence for good. Now, I'm not going to stand up and say it's a sin to get a tattoo. I can't prove that from the Bible. Uh, Leviticus uh, is written to Old Testament Israel. It's not for us today, and that's the only verse in the Bible that I know of that specifically mentions tattoos. But in all that we do, in all that we say, in all that we wear, as Trevor's pointed out, be concerned with how we come across to other people. Don't hurt your influence for good. So you can be able to reach people for Christ and have a good influence on other people. Now, make the application to tattoos, and this is one of those things where uh, we have to say it falls into the realm of liberty that the Apostle Paul discusses in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. There are things that are neither wrong nor right in and of themselves, but we have to take Bible principles and apply those principles to ourselves to make sure that we're being a good influence on other people without binding our opinions on other people. So I may have an application to myself that is a matter of my personal conscience. It's a matter of liberty, but I don't say you have to follow that. That applies to me. It's a matter of my personal conscience. And that falls into the realm of liberty that the Apostle Paul discusses in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Well, Trevor, that's all I would have to say on that matter concerning tattoos since there's nothing specific in the New Testament about it. Right. Is there anything you would like to add to that? No, I, I think I'm, I'm good. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, we have another question then this evening, and I really think that perhaps we won't have enough time to cover it fully on this program because I believe it's a, a question that we need to develop fully. Uh, and so here's what the question is. How can I become a member of the Church of Christ? Well, Trevor, uh, when somebody uh, comes out to Piet, do you have a, a questionnaire they can have to fill out before you allow them to be a member of the church? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, no, tell don't. us about that. How can you become a member of the Church of Christ? All right. Well, it's, it is a really good question. I, I was glad we, we received this question. Uh, no, and, you know, we don't, uh, in, in Piet, we don't baptize anybody into the, the church at Piet. And I know the same is true for Highway 5 South because I've been there often and I know the brethren there. I know Keith very well. And I know that that is not taught there. Well, you know, the first thing I would do, though, is we're talking about becoming a member of the Church of Christ. Uh, I would like to just establish that there is such a thing, uh, first of all, from the Scriptures. In Matthew chapter 16, uh, Jesus and his apostles are having a discussion about who he, who Jesus is, and uh, who do the people say that I am, is what he asked them uh, originally. But in the text of verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In verse 18, Jesus says, I will build my church, and then he goes on to say the gates of Hades, that is the gates of, <clears throat> excuse me, of death, will not prevail against it, it will not have an end. Once, once, I, once I build it, once it starts, it will never come to an end. So Jesus said ahead of time, I'm going to build my church. So it does, it's not an existence uh, in Matthew chapter 16 because it's a future reference. I will, in the future, build my church. And I believe there's some hints as to when and how he's going to do this, even in the immediate context, where he talks to Peter about giving him the keys of the kingdom of heaven and about Peter and the other apostles are included in this. Having the keys to the kingdom and binding and loosing things on earth that are bound and loosed in heaven. In other words, these are heavenly doctrine. This is heavenly doctrine, heavenly teaching, teaching from God, the binding and loosing. So Jesus said, "I'm going to build my church." Well, Ephesians chapter two. I'll go to this passage and then I'll turn it back to you, Keith. Ephesians chapter two goes along with this very nicely. Um, you know, Jesus said, "I'm going to build my church." Well, did he build it? When did he build it? it has already been built. Well, according to Ephesians chapter 2, this is one of the texts that we can go to that shows that the building had already begun. And Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 19, Paul says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now that household of God is very important. Back over in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 15, Paul says that the house of God is the church of the living God. And so in context, he's talking about the household of God would be the people of God, God's people. That would include his church, the assembly. In verse 20, the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So he describes the, the church, the house of God, as being like a building. Well, Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. Jesus spoke in the same type of manner as Paul is speaking here. I'm going to build my church. Well, in verse 20 there, he says that the church has been built, so the building had begun, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. That goes on quite nicely with what Jesus said. Jesus told Peter that he was going to build his church, and he said, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom, and you're going to bind and loose things. Well, Paul says here that the, the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. In other words, the words that they spoke, the words that they gave, uh, the commandments that they gave. That's how his church would be built. Uh, you know, I'm going to stop there, Keith, and, and turn it over to you. That kind of gets us started, though, that there is a church of Christ. Right. And, and, and it, the building had already begun there in Acts chapter, well, in Ephesians 2, excuse me. 
good, Trevor. I, I appreciate your approach. I think you're approaching it in a good way that people need to know that we're talking about something that is specifically covered in the Bible. And I want to continue in your approach. We won't be able to finish answering the question on this program. We'll have to come back to this uh, next Sunday night and, and finish answering the question. Uh, but I want to uh, uh, also establish that the word church is used in three senses in the New Testament. And we need to understand the sense in which it is being used when the person asks the question. First of all, back to a passage that Trevor mentioned. This is the first time in the Bible that the word church is mentioned. It's Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, where Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, I believe that the church he's talking about there is the universal body of the saved, the body of Christ. Uh, the church is the body of Christ, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, and there's only one such body, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. And, and so the universal body of all the saved people, you can't be saved outside of Christ. The church is the body of Christ, it's the fullness of Him, Ephesians 1, verses 22 and 23, and there's only one such body or church. Jesus has only one body. He has only one church, and all the saved are a part of it, uh, because all, all spiritual blessings, including salvation, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10, are found in Christ. And, and so uh, that's the first sense in which the word church is used in the Bible is the universal body of the saved. But there's a second sense in which the word church is used. The second time the word church is used in the Bible is Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17, where if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he'll hear you, you've gained your brother. If he won't hear you, take with you one or two witnesses, that of the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. But if he won't hear them, then he says, tell it to the church. What does it mean to tell it to every Christian in the world? Well, of course not. That's in the sense of a local church, the local congregation. So that's the second sense in which the word church is used. And Trevor made the point uh, that just because uh, you're baptized into Christ does not mean you're a member of the Piat Church of Christ. And the same thing is true of the Highway 5 South Church of Christ. You, be you become a member of the body of Christ in one way. You become a member of a local congregation in another way. But all of those who are members of the local church ought to be members of the universal body of Christ. There's a third sense in which the word church is used in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 18, Paul says, First of all, when you come together as a church, and so when the local congregation comes together in the assembly to worship the Lord, that is how the word church is used. By the way, that's the literal meaning of the word church. The word church from the Greek word ekklesia literally means a called out assembly. And so when the church assembles, then that's the third way in which the word church is used. Now, we need to look at this then from two standpoints. We'll have to do this in the next program. How does one become a member of the body of Christ? The universal body of the saved. And the second question is, how does one become a member of a local church? Now, notice I did not ask, how does one become a member of a denomination? Because the word church is never used in the entire Bible in the sense of a denomination. And Trevor, next time, is going to tell us all about those things, about how we become a member of the universal body of the saved and how we become a member of a local church. Thank you so much for watching the program this evening. Please watch next time. Thank you for watching Search the Scriptures. If you have a Bible question or comment, you may call 870-321-5746, email keithsharp at suddenlink.net, or write Keith Sharp at P.O. Box 263, Mountain Home, Arkansas, 72654. And your question will be answered on the air. Be sure to watch next week at the same time for another edition of Search the Scriptures. Until then, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.